In this video, we'll build a simple B-tree data structure in Haskell, using a GADT to ensure that we maintain the B-tree structural invariant. As in my previous video on whole-driven Haskell, we use types to guide the development. Although B-trees come in various sizes, I'll be restricting our attention to the smallest possible B-tree. I'll refer to this variant as a 2-3 B-tree, though others might use a different name for the same structure. We can define a 2-3 B-tree informally by three rules. Firstly, a 2-3 B-tree comprises either a node with one element and two subtrees, or a node with two elements and three subtrees, or a leaf containing nothing at all. Secondly, every leaf must be equidistant from the root of a tree, and finally, data must be ordered left to right. So what's the motivation for these seemingly arbitrary rules? Well, the third rule means that we can search for an item within a tree without backtracking. Left to right ordering allows us to narrow the search to at most one subtree using just one or two comparisons with the elements in a node. The first and second rules together mean that each narrowing is by a factor of between one half and one third. As a result, search takes logarithmic time in the worst case. Finally, the first rule also gives us just enough flexibility to implement some useful operations, including insertion and deletion, also in logarithmic time. Now, to represent a 2-3 B tree in Haskell, we can make a first approximation using a pair of mutually recursive data types that capture just the first rule. The type n describes the structure of internal nodes, while t describes the overall recursive structure of the B tree. I could have written this with a single data type, but splitting it up like this will make things clearer later on. Unfortunately, this definition makes it possible to construct trees like this one, which breaks the second rule requiring all leaves to be equidistant from the root. We'd need something other than the types to ensure that the search doesn't blow out to a linear time algorithm. We can do better than this, but before I can show you how, I need to introduce GADT style definitions. Consider the types of the constructors in our definition of T. For example, the branch constructor is a function that takes an argument of type n of a and constructs a T of a. Whereas our ordinary data definition lists the types of the components of each constructor, from which the types of the constructors are inferred, a GADT style definition gives the type of the constructor itself and the types of the components are inferred. Aside from syntax, the important difference between the two styles is that a GADT gives the result type of each constructor explicitly, whereas the ordinary definition always implies that all of the constructor's result types are just the same as the type being defined. So what have we gained? Well, in the GADT, we're allowed to specialize the type variables in the constructor result types. We can use this to encode the second rule, which we rephrase to say that subtrees of an internal node must all have the same height. Now we need to measure the heights of trees, and we'll do this using the standard unary definition of natural numbers, which says that a natural number is either zero or the successor of some other natural number. Although this is an ordinary data definition, we're actually interested in using Z and S as type constructors, and for that, we'll use GHC's data kinds extension. An important property of this definition is that Z and S of P are distinct for any P, and also S of P and S of Q are distinct types if and only if P and Q are distinct types. We can now add a type index to our tree to reflect its height. So rather than describing trees of some element type, we now describe trees of a particular height and element type. Naturally, we define a leaf as a tree of height zero, and when an internal node has subtrees at height n, we define the resulting branch node to have height s of n. We also need to annotate the type of an internal node n with the same height as its components, but this only requires an ordinary Haskell data type. Now that we've captured the first two rules, we only need to remember to keep our data ordered. But before we head to the code, let's illustrate the insertion algorithm. We'll start with a B tree containing the elements 1 to 3, and we'll insert the element 4. First, we search from the root of the tree to find the insertion point. This will always be at the base of the tree. In this case, there is room to grow the node at the insertion point, so we construct a new node containing the existing contents and the new element. Remember these are immutable structures, so we perform operations by creating new structures that share parts of the old structures. Working backwards, we reconstruct the search path, incorporating the new node and parts of the old structure wherever possible. If we no longer need the old version of the structure, it can be reclaimed by garbage collection. Now if we want to insert a 5, we can't extend the node at the insertion point because it already has the maximum size. I'll call this an overflow. Instead we create a pair of nodes containing 3 and 5 and push the in-between element 4 up to the next level. We need this extra element at the next level up because we have an extra subtree at this level and subtrees and elements are always interleaved. Then to complete the insertion we create a new node to combine the pushed element with the existing parent node and garbage collect the unused parts of the old version. There are no surprises if we insert a 6 into this tree, though at this point I'll give up showing both old and new versions, and just assume that you understand what it means to operate on immutable structures. 
But now if we insert a 7, we get an overflow at the insertion point, which then causes an overflow at the parent node. In turn, this pushes the in-between element 4 up to the next level. Since there is no parent, this creates a new level, and this is how bee trees grow. OK, at last we're ready to look at some code. Here, you can see the data types that we previously defined. I have a couple of helper functions, and I've also enabled a number of language extensions. GADTs is needed for our tree data type, and DataKinds allows us to use our NAT constructors as types. The others are to support the whole driven style of development that I described in my previous video. I'm going to add some dummy types, which will use to trick GHC into telling us the types of things in our environment. We'll use foo to elaborate ordinary data types, and we'll use m and p for nat kinded types. And I'll add smart constructors for the common cases where we want to construct a branch node containing a t1 or t2. Now, having tree depth information in our types might help us get our implementation right, but it will cause problems for our clients, who aren't interested in such implementation details. We can hide the depth indices from our clients using an existential type. The GADT syntax works quite well for this. We define a type with a single constructor which takes our depth index t and builds a non-index tree to give to the client. Just as important, when we pattern match on a tree, we temporarily get access to our depth index t. Let's start with the type of insert. For any type a, insert takes an a and a tree of a and gives us back a tree of a. For searching within a tree, we also need an order relation on a. Now for the implementation, I'll delegate to a worker function ints because I want to explicitly write its type, including the depth indices. If I deliberately write an incorrect type for ints, GHC tells me what type it expected, so I'll write that as a type of ints, adding an explicit for all binder for the depth index n. Now t is a recursive structure, so ints will be a recursive function. But see how the argument to ints carries its depth n in its type. If ints returns a tree, that depth information is lost, and this means we won't be able to recombine the result of recursive call with its sibling t structures. So this is no good. Instead, let's make a new intermediate result type ints, which does carry depth information. We'll need a function finish to convert this to a tree at the top level. OK, so what does ints look like? Remember that one of two things can happen when we insert an element into a subtree. In the first case, the inserted element can be accommodated in slack space somewhere in the subtree which means that the result is just a new t at the same level. I'll call this case keep. In the second case, the subtree overflows, pushing an element up to the parent, sandwiched between a pair of subtrees. Now we can easily write finish by unwrapping each case and constructing the corresponding tree. And note that the second case produces a tree one level higher than the first. Of course, we're also going to have to do a similar case analysis every time we receive an ints. And it turns out that we'll always do this immediately after its construction. That's going to get tedious, so I think we'll get a more sensible implementation if we switch to a continuation passing style. This means passing functions that inline the result of the case analysis wherever we would otherwise construct an ints value. So we do this by converting keep and push to function types which take their respective components as arguments, and ultimately return the result tree. But instead of returning tree explicitly, I'll generalize to a type variable t, because polymorphic types help to constrain their implementations. The type variable will only be instantiated to tree of a at the top level. Now when we call ints, we pass a keep and a push as alternative continuations. The implementation of ints will need to call one of these to construct something of the type variable t. For example, at the top level, instead of calling finish, we pass continuations corresponding to the two cases of finish. For keep, the continuation is just the tree constructor, and for push, we construct a new t1 node inside a tree. That type checks, so let's get rid of the stuff we're no longer using. Now there are two cases ints must handle, one for each constructor of t, so let's stub them out. An interesting thing happens here. Remember that the values of t have type indices that depend on which constructor was applied. So when we match on the constructor, the types of its components might be refined. That's why I've delayed naming the continuation parameters because I want to explicitly write their refined types. Let's start with an easy case, the leaf constructor. I'll delegate this to a subordinate definition i so I can write its type. The depth type index gets refined by the pattern match, so let's use a dummy nat m to provoke a type error which tells us that this should have been a z. And that's great, because it tells us a lot about what these continuations expect as arguments. We can also write assertions to check that we know how to expand the types of the continuations, like this. Now i needs to produce something of type variable t, and the only things we have that can do that are the keep and push continuations. So we'll need to call one or the other. Both continuations require arguments of type t of z of a. 
and looking back at our definition for t, it's clear that the only thing that has that type is a leaf. So we have two possibilities. We could keep a leaf, but then we've clearly failed to insert x. Alternatively, we can push something sandwiched between a pair of leaves. GHC tells us that that thing needs to be of type A, and of course that would be the x that we're inserting. This makes sense because push is meant for the case where insertion causes overflow. And of course, a leaf can never contain data, so it always overflows. I'll tidy this up a bit, and then we can move on to a more interesting case, the branch constructor. Again, we'll delegate, but we'll pass through the internal node so we can include it in the insertion of the refined type. Because this case needs to work at any tree depth, except the leaves, I'll use variables p and m for the depth indices of the internal node and continuations. I use separate variables because I'm not yet sure of the relationship between p and m. Now, although this type checks, it's too general. We won't be able to call the continuations because we can't construct arguments of the right types if p and m are unconstrained. So to help us find the right constraint, I'll provoke a type error by attempting to constrain the variables to our dummy nats, capital P and M. Essentially, this error tells us that we want M to be the successor of P. And this makes sense because the components of the internal node are a level below the node from which they came. There are two cases for internal nodes, T1 and T2. I'll focus on the T2 case, which is the more interesting. As before, we can write assertions to expand the types of the continuations. Now to insert x, we compare it to b and d. I have a helper function, select2, to expand this into five cases. All five cases need to construct something of type variable t, and it's clear from the types of what's in scope that we'll have to call one of the continuations to do that. In the case where x equals b, we want to replace the t2 node with a new one which has x in place of b. The type of the new node is n p of a. But to construct the required t, we'll need to call a continuation with the t of m of a, where m is the successor of p. We can get that by substituting our smart constructor, and then it's clear from the types that we need to use the keep continuation. This makes sense because keep is intended for the case where there is no overflow. And the case where x equals d is much the same. When x is less than b, we want to recursively insert into the left subtree, which is a. Remember, ints takes continuations to handle the result of the recursive insertion, so this is just a tail call. I'll name the continuations for the recursive call as rkeep and rpush, so I can ask GHC to tell me their types. And I'll also name the arguments to rkeep and rpush. We're buried a little deep here, so let's take our bearings. We've been called to insert x into a t2 node, and we've been given continuations keep and push to call with the result of the insertion. To perform the insertion, we've determined we need to recursively insert into A, and the recursive call requires us to provide new continuations R keep and R push. One of the continuations we provide will receive the result of the recursive call, either a TPA in the case of R keep, or an A sandwich between a pair of TPA in the case of R push. In both cases, we'll need to use those results to construct a suitable argument to pass back to one of keep or push. Note that the arguments we pass to keep or push need to be TMA, which is a level higher than those we'll receive from R keep or R push. So, R keep handles the case where the recursive insertion does not overflow. In that case, our T2 node also does not overflow, and we need to only construct a new T2 node, replacing A with the result of the recursive insertion, which is K. As we can see, the type of this new node is TMA, which is just what we need to pass to keep to obtain the result of type T. Now, R push handles the case where the recursive insertion overflows. The result consists of P, Q, and R, which should replace A in the T2 node. Since we also need to keep B, C, D, and E, we clearly can't accommodate everything in a single node. So what can we do? We could construct two layers of T1 nodes, but when we check the type, it's a level too high for either of the continuations. But the inner T1 nodes are at the right level, so we have exactly what we need to pass to push, along with the in-between element. Again, this makes sense because if the recursive insertion overflows, our T2 node, which is already full, must also overflow. Now, if we tidy up, inlining R keep and R push, it's easy to follow the pattern to complete the other two subcases. So that completes the T2 case. The T1 case is similar, so you can either attempt that yourself or find the code via the link at the start of this video. Now let's look at deletion. 
This is more complicated than insertion, and we'll need a couple of tricks to make our types work. In return, the types work even harder to help us get this right. But first, let's look at some informal illustrations of the algorithm. We'll start with this seven element tree, and we'll delete the element three, which happens to be at the base of the tree. Remember for insertion, we had to deal with overflow. In contrast, when we delete this element, we have an underflow, which we handle by pulling an element from the parent node. In turn, this causes an underflow in its parent node, which pulls from the root node, causing the tree to shrink by one level. Now, just as we always inserted at the base of the tree, we also always delete from the base of the tree. So what do we do when the element we want to delete is not at the base of the tree? In this case, we simply replace the element to be deleted with its immediate predecessor or successor, which will always be at the base of the tree. It doesn't matter which, so I'll just choose the predecessor. This replacement maintains the left-right order and allows the deletion to proceed from the base of the tree. So this means that deletion is a two-phase operation. We have a search phase which uses the usual comparisons to find the element to be deleted, and a replace phase which locates its immediate predecessor. The latter simply traverses to the rightmost element of the subtree to the left of the element to be deleted. So we perform the replacement and then proceed with the deletion as before. Here we can also see what happens when the sibling of an underflow is full. In this case we get a rotation instead of a pull. If you like, you can think of a rotation as a pull which is then followed by an overflow that occurs when the pulled element tries to combine with the full sibling. There are a couple of other cases that arise during deletion, however I won't show them because one of the things I'm trying to demonstrate here is that when we make good use of types, it's enough to have an understanding of the general shape of the algorithm. We don't need to fully catalogue all the cases because the types will show us the details. OK, so let's implement delete. The type of delete is the same as insert, and as before, we'll delegate to a worker function using continuation passing style. Remember, deletion occurs in two phases, search and replace, so we'll start with the tail call to the search phase. The type of the search worker is similar to the ints worker, except now we have to deal with underflow instead of overflow, so our second continuation will be a pull instead of a push. We don't quite know what pull looks like, but it is a continuation, so it must be a function returning t. For now, we'll just assume that it takes an argument of some type, shrunk na, which we'll elaborate later. At the top of the tree, the keep continuation will just be a tree constructor, as before and the pull continuation will be some function shrink, which takes a shrunk n a to a tree of a. This time, I won't bother to delegate any deeper than this, so there are three cases for search to handle. However, I'm going to ignore the t2 case since it doesn't add anything particularly interesting. You can either try it yourself or find the code via the link at the beginning of this video. The leaf case is easy. If we're still in the search phase when we hit the bottom of the tree, there is nothing we need to delete, so we just keep a leaf. In fact, as we'll see later, the types actually prevent us from doing anything else. In the T1 case, we compare x with b and split into three subcases, all of which need to construct something of type variable t. When x is less than b, we continue the search phase in the left subtree, which is a. If that doesn't underflow, we keep a new T1, which we construct by replacing a with the result of the recursive search. We'll figure out what to do with underflow later, and the case where x is greater than b is similar. Now, when x is equal to b, we found the item we need to delete, so we enter the replace phase. Remember, to keep the tree ordered, we need to replace the deleted item with its immediate predecessor, so we can handle the deletion from the bottom of the tree. We find the predecessor by traversing to the rightmost element of the left subtree, which means we start the replace phase with a. The replace phase will also have alternative keep and pull continuations. The keep continuation needs to know what replacement to use for b, so we'll call the replacement r and include it as an additional argument to the continuation. The pull continuation will also need an extra argument for the replacement, but we'll otherwise leave this to later. So now in the type of replace, we need to add the extra argument to the types of the continuations, which we can do like this. And now we run into a problem. When we try to implement the leave case, we're stuck. To construct a t, we need to call either the keep or pull continuation, and both of them require a replacement argument of type a. But we don't have anything of type a, except of course x, which is what we're supposed to delete. To see where we went wrong, rewind to where I said that when the search phase found the item to delete, the replace phase would select the predecessor by finding the rightmost element of the left subtree. But of course that only makes sense if the left subtree is non-empty. If the left subtree is just a leaf, then there is no need for a replace phase. 
we're already at the bottom of the tree, so we can just start the deletion from where we are. However, to avoid the extra case analysis, we'll call replace anyway and just pass through the result that replace should return if it finds a leaf. In this case, if A and C are leaves and we delete B, our T node will underflow. So we'll need to pull, though we're not yet sure what that means. Now the result that replace needs is of type T, so that's also the type of the extra argument. If you like, you can think of this as a null continuation. And it's this argument that replace returns if it finds a leaf. When replace finds a T1 node, it seeks the rightmost element, immediately recursing into the right subtree, which is C. If the recursive call doesn't underflow, we keep a new T1 node, in which we replace C with the result of the recursive replace. Note that the replacement for the deleted item is passed through as an invisible extra argument. Again, we'll defer thinking about underflow. The third argument of the recursive call is for the case when C is a leaf. In that case, A must also be a leaf, and B must be the immediate predecessor of the deleted item. So we pull, though we're not yet sure what, but we do pass B as the second argument to replace the deleted item. So at last we're forced to figure out the shrunk data type. Looking at the pull continuations, it seems clear that a shrunk value received from a recursive call must contain all the elements of the subtree recursed into, except for a single deleted element. If the recursive call had not underflowed, the keep continuation would have been called. So we know that the shrunk value is necessarily smaller than that subtree. At the top of the tree, the underflow should result in a tree which is one level shorter than the original tree. Compare that with the overflow case in insert, which results in a tree one level higher. So essentially, a shrunk NA would just be a T of N minus 1A. Now we don't have a predecessor operation for our type level NAT numbers. We could construct one, but as it turns out, we don't need to. In fact, it's best if shrunk of ZA is uninhabited because this ensures that deletion from an empty subtree is handled by the keep continuation. So if we only need to consider shrunk of S of N of A, then its contents are just a T of N A. We can express this by defining shrunk as another GADT with a single constructor H that takes a T of N A to a shrunk of S of N of A. To map this back to a tree, we just rewrap the contents. Note the type of the shrink mapping. It takes a shrunk N A, not a shrunk of S of N of A. If we try the latter, the program is rejected because search requires a pull continuation for any n, not just s of n. But how can this be if we can only construct a shrunk of s of n of a? The point is that it's entirely possible to construct a function that takes a shrunk of n a for any n. However, we'll only be able to apply this function to those shrunk of n a that we can actually construct, which is just those shrunk of s of n of a. Remember that pattern matching on a GADT refines the type of the branch, so when we match on the H constructor, the N gets refined to S of N anyway. And it's exactly this property of GADTs that ensures that our pull continuation can only be applied in the case that the recursive call has actually shrunk the subtree. It's also what prevents us from using pull when search finds a leaf. So now we can implement our pull continuations, which need to combine the shrunk value with the siblings of the subtree recursed into. In the case where X is less than B, we need to combine P with B and C. I'll call this merging, and note that it's asymmetric, since P and C have different types. Thus we'll have left and right merges for the T1 case, depending on whether P replaces the left or right subtree. For this case, we'll have a merge left of P, B, and C. And for the case when X is greater than B, we'll have a merge right of A, B, and P. Now when X equals B, we'll have another merge left, since we start the replace phase in the left subtree. We'll use the replacement value R instead of B, because B is being deleted. So the values we merge are P, R, and C. So what is the type of merge left? It takes a shrunk P, A, an A, and a T, P, A, and as with all our continuations, returns a T. Here P is one level below N, so we can express that in a constraint. And merge R takes the same types in reverse order. The cases that merge left has to consider are those of its third argument of type T, P, A. When the argument is a T1 node, we have A, C, and E, which are T nodes at the level below P, interspersed with B and D, which are just values of type A. These will all fit in a single T2 node, but do we keep or pull? Well, the types can tell us. If we try to keep, we can see that we're at the wrong level, even though GHC has renamed the type variable. This makes sense, because the components here are two levels below the T1 node where we started. We dropped one level when we made the recursive call to search, and another when we pattern matched on the arguments of merge left. So instead we need to pull, and since pull expects a shrunk value, we also need to wrap the T2 node in an H constructor. 
Now when merge left finds a T2 node, we have A, C, E and G, which are T nodes at the level below P, interspersed with values B, D and F. We can't fit those all into a single node, so we need to split into two layers of T1 nodes. This time we've regained the two levels that we dropped, so it makes sense that pull is rejected, but keep is accepted. Now what about the case where merge left finds a leaf? This case actually makes no sense because merge left only occurs in the context of an underflow, and an underflow cannot originate in a row of leaves. Fortunately, the types actually prevent us from implementing this case. Remember that pattern matching on a GADT refines type variables. Matching on the H constructor refines P to S of some Q, while matching on a leaf refines P to Z. Of course, P cannot be both S of Q and Z, so this is a type error. Similarly, it would also be an error to attempt to call merge left with values that would have matched this case. And so it's safe to just leave this case out. The implementation of merge right is much the same as merge left. We just have to reverse everything. Now replace also has a pull continuation. Since replace recurses into the right subtree, this is a merge right of A, B and P. The type of this merge right is similar to the type of merge right in the search phase, except this merge right takes an extra argument for the replacement value. However, despite the different type, the implementation is exactly the same, because in the context of replace, keep and pull also expect this extra argument. Obviously we should factor out this common code, and that just requires us to pass the keep and pull continuations explicitly, rather than capturing them from the environment. To account for the different types, we just generalize the continuation's result type. Now all that remains is to figure out what to pass as the third continuation argument in each call to replace. Remember this is the nullary continuation that is only used when replace finds a leaf. Within search this occurs when we find the item to be deleted at the bottom of the tree. So we want to drop that item and pull an empty tree. Or in other words, pull an H of leaf. Although this is correct for the case we're interested in, it has the wrong type for all the other cases. Because pull expects a shrunk NA, not always a shrunk S of ZA. So where can we find a value that is leaf in the case we care about, and otherwise has the right type? Of course this value is only used when A is a leaf, and A always has the right type, and so we can just use A instead of leaf. If you just raised an eyebrow, then yes, I agree this is a bit tricky, and usually we don't like tricky code. But the only alternative I've found so far is to put data into the leaves, and that causes the code to blow up by about a factor of two. I'm not sure which is worse, but I do know which I can fit onto your screen, so please leave a comment if you can show me a better way. Similarly, within replace, this case occurs exactly when we've just found the immediate predecessor, B, of the item being deleted. We're already passing B back as the replacement for the deleted item, and since that leaves us with nothing else, we need to pull a leaf. But to satisfy the type, we use A instead. To complete the implementation of delete, we would need to fill in the T2 cases for both search and replace. But since that's just more of the same, I'll leave the video here. You can try to finish this yourself, or find my code by the link shown at the start of the video. So hopefully you've been able to see that using types well can not only guard against a larger class of errors, but can also help us to find the right implementation. And for the most part, the types don't get in our way. Note that our GADT only specifies the B-tree structure invariant. It doesn't specify the order invariant, and it certainly doesn't ensure that our functions actually perform insertion and deletion. We still need to test for those properties. Perhaps in a future video I'll look at ways to guarantee the latter properties using types.